Hey everyone, if you've already looked at the title of this episode, then you can probably guess we're going to be covering some pretty horrible topics. There's nothing too explicit as far as swearing or anything like that, but any subject like the Holocaust requires some parental advisory. So if you're listening with kids, consider this your parental advisory warning. This past February, when La La Land was nominated for an amazing 14 Oscars, that tied 1950's All About Eve and 1997's Titanic for the most nominations in the history of the Academy Awards. While All About Eve isn't based on a true story, interestingly, the man who wrote and directed that film was Joseph Mankiewicz. If that last name sounds familiar, it's because Joseph was the brother of Herman Mankiewicz, the man who co-wrote Citizen Kane with Orson Welles. Of course, we've already covered Citizen Kane here on this series, and we've also taken a look at the true story behind Titanic. Although La La Land received all of those nominations, it only ended up going home with six of those Oscars. Only. As if that's not an incredible achievement. It is, but it's not quite as unique. There have been 12 films throughout the history of the Academy Awards that have received six Oscars. That's one less than yet another movie we've looked at on this podcast, Lawrence of Arabia, which won seven Oscars in 1962. Another film with seven Oscar wins is the epic film we're looking at today. Starring Liam Neeson, Ray Fiennes, and Ben Kingsley, with Steven Spielberg directing behind the camera, Schindler's List took home seven Oscars in 1993 as it went on to take home almost $100 million at the box office compared to only a $22 million budget. There's so many films that deserve the title of Hollywood blockbuster, and Schindler's List is certainly one of them. But as we've learned with so many other films, some of those that I've mentioned, Citizen Kane, Titanic, and Lawrence of Arabia, for example, being a Hollywood blockbuster doesn't always mean it's historically accurate. In fact, sometimes it means quite the opposite. So how does Schindler's List hold up to history? I'm Dan Lefebvre, and this is Based on a True Story. It's time for Two Truths and a Lie. Listen closely for the two truths scattered throughout the episode. Then, by process of elimination, you'll know which one was a lie. We'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. Okay, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Oscar Schindler was officially a member of the Nazi party. Number two, its ex Stern was the one who typed... Schindler's List. Number three, the girl in the red coat didn't actually die at the Platzau camp. Now, before we get back to the show, I wanted to let you know that you can recommend a movie to get covered over at Based on a True Story Podcast.com slash recommend. And if you want to guarantee that episode will get made, you can actually sponsor an episode by becoming an official producer or executive producer of the show over at patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast. And as an added benefit, your sponsorship will help make sure that I can keep buying the movies, books, research material, hosting, and all of the other costs that go into making the show. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash recommend to recommend an episode, and patreon.com slash based on a true story podcast to sponsor your own episode. And don't worry, I'll put links to those in the show notes. And with that, let's compare history with Hollywood's version of Schindler's List. The 
The movie begins in color as we see a Jewish family lighting their Shabbos candles. Zooming into the candle, the film slowly transitions into black and white before sending us back in time to 1939 when Polish Jews were forced into the Krakow ghetto immediately after the Nazis occupied the region. This whole little introduction with the family singing in color and people lining up to register for the Krakow ghetto may have been dramatized, but the spirit of what's going on here is very true. Krakow is a city in southwestern Poland that dates back to the 7th century, making it one of the oldest cities in the region. It was also the second largest city in Poland, making it home to many Polish citizens, including many Jews. Because of the large population of Polish Jews in the city, when the Nazis first overran the city on September 6, 1939, it didn't take long for them to round up all of the Jews. Just days after they arrived, the Nazis ordered any Jewish person 12 years or older to identify with the Star of David armband and began forcing them to work, essentially using them for slave labor. Back in the movie, after setting up the time and location, we're introduced to the main character, Oscar Schindler, as played by Liam Neeson. We first meet him in a restaurant where he manages to go from sitting alone at a table to buying a drink for an SS officer, and in no time at all, the entire restaurant is joining Oscar Schindler's party. We don't really know if the specific party took place like we saw in the movie, but the plot line is actually quite true. And by that, what I mean is Oscar Schindler was quite adept at bribing and cozying up to Nazi officers to get their approval, and drinking was a common activity among them. This is a familiar theme that we see throughout the film, but it's something that's introduced here quite plainly. Now, before we jump back into the movie, let's take a couple moments just to learn a little bit more about the real Oscar Schindler. Oscar was born in 1908 in Zwitau, which is now in the Czech Republic, but back then it was part of the Austria-Hungary Empire. Oscar's family was wealthy thanks to his father's business ventures, so it wouldn't be too far off to say that he was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. Despite this, he didn't coast through life on his family's money. It's worth pointing out, though, that Oscar's father was a heavy drinker and quite the womanizer. In 1936, Oscar worked in the Office of Military Foreign Intelligence for the German Army, that service was short-lived as he left the German army and in 1938 joined the reserves for the Czechoslovakian army. In February of 1939, Oskar Schindler officially joined the Nazi party. As the Nazis' power grew, simultaneously, his family's business started to fail. Oskar went to work as a salesman for the business, trying to use his Nazi connections for his benefit. That's a very brief overview, but it brings us up to October of 1939 when Oskar Schindler moved to Krakow in Poland. Why did he move there? Well, unfortunately, it's really hard to know people's intentions sometimes. It's not like there's documentation for every decision. Despite this, most historians have surmised that he moved to Krakow to take advantage of a new, low-cost workforce that was emerging in the area. That workforce, of course, was the Jewish population that were being forced to work at the hand of the Nazis. But others have suggested that may not have been the reason, instead suggesting that when Oscar moved to Krakow, he didn't know about what essentially was slave labor. Again, we run into the problem of not having every fact in someone's knowledge being documented, so we may never really know for sure. In the movie, Liam Neeson's version of Oscar turns to a Jewish accountant named Itzhak Stern to help him run his business. And by help, I mean to run his business for him. Probably the only comedic moment in Schindler's List happens when Liam Neeson is sitting opposite Itzhak and explaining that he needs Itzhak's help finding investors and running the business. Itzhak, who's played by the fabulous actor Ben Kingsley, says something to the effect of, well, if I'm finding the investors and running the business, what are you doing again? Of course, and according to the film, as a Jew in Nazi-occupied Poland, it's illegal 
for Itzak to own a business, so Oscar would provide the legal ownership and help with the sales side. Like many scenes, we don't know if this particular meetup actually happened, but the general spirit is true. The outcome of the meeting is pretty close to what actually happened in history. Let's start with Itzak Stern. He was a very real person who was born in 1901, making him about seven years older than Oscar. As we learned earlier, there's some debate about whether or not Oscar moved to Krakow to take advantage of a cheap Jewish workforce. One of the reasons for that debate was because it was Itzak Stern who made the suggestion to Oscar that he take advantage of Jewish labor. For Oscar, the logic makes sense. Jews didn't have to be paid as much as the Poles. For Itzak, he seemed to have recognized that Oscar was somewhat different than other Nazis. Working for him would be better than whatever alternatives there were. And so, just like the movie shows, a rather unorthodox partnership was formed between Oscar Schindler, an official member of the Nazi party, and Itzak Stern, a Jewish accountant. While the movie makes it seem like Oscar was starting a business from scratch. In truth, he actually bought a company called Record Limited. That's R-E-K-O-R-D. It was an enamelware business like the movie shows. Record was owned by Jews before Oscar bought it from them. And then after purchasing it, he renamed it to the Deutsche Enamelware Fabric Oscar Schindler, or essentially the German enamelware factory Oscar Schindler. Again, we don't have a lot of documentation into Oscar's true intentions with his decisions here, but we can make some educated guesses. First, since we know Nazis made it illegal for Jews to own a business, it's likely that whomever owned Record sold it to Oscar for next to nothing. After all, what's the alternative? Give it up for literally nothing? And as for the renaming, this is my own speculation, but it wouldn't be surprising to me if Oscar did this in an effort to distance the company from its once Jewish ownership. Ever the opportunist, Oscar knew the Nazis in power wouldn't want to do business with a company owned by Jews, and it's likely he didn't want to take the risk that they might not want to be associated with a company that used to be owned by Jews. Despite these speculations, one fact we do know is that Oscar did manage to secure some investment money from Jews in Krakow to build his business. That's something that the movie shows pretty accurately. Back in the movie, there's a brief moment early on when we're introduced to Oscar's wife. She comes to visit Oscar in Krakow, knocking on the door to find another woman answering the door. This really doesn't seem to phase her, though, which gives us the implication that it's not the first time Oscar has cheated on her. Of course, the dramatization of that particular moment on screen likely wasn't how it actually happened. But again, the spirit of the story is very true. Oscar Schindler married Emily Peltzel in 1928, when Oscar was only 19 years old. It was a marriage that would last Oscar's entire life. However, it was also a marriage that Oscar would never be faithful to. Maybe it was because of his father's womanizing or some other reason we'll never truly understand, but Oscar had an untold number of mistresses throughout his life. For example, in 1933, while still married to Emily, Oscar had an affair with the secretary at his father's business. Her name was Aurelie Schlegel, and together Oscar and Aurelie had two children, one boy, and one girl. Or maybe it was one child. Oscar was convinced that the boy, who was the younger of the two children, was not his. That boy's name? Oscar Jr. Back in the movie, there's another moment where there's a mix-up with paperwork that sees its ex-stern forced onto a train and nearly taken to a concentration camp. It would have almost certainly meant his death. But Oscar Schindler shows up just in time to convince the Nazi officers to let Itzek go. During the dialogue, one of the officers tells Oscar that it doesn't really matter to them. Itzek wasn't really a person. As a Jew, this one, that one, none of them really matter. Although we don't know if the movie is entirely accurate here, again, the spirit is quite right. Even though Oscar may have been a member of the Nazi party, it wasn't like 
it was a party-wide thing that he was doing. So it was on Oscar to keep up with the necessary paperwork to ensure anyone else in the Nazi party that he came across would leave Itzek alone. As for Itzek Stern, he would later admit that he was suspicious of Oscar from the very beginning. He was, after all, a Nazi. The alternative to working with Oscar, though, wasn't great. So the movie's plotline where both Oscar and Itzek had their own separate reasons for wanting to work together is true. Going back to the film, we're introduced to another major character around this point. His name is Amon Gert, and he's portrayed in the film by Ray Fiennes. He was also a very real person. While the movie doesn't really have a lot of indication as to how much time is passing. We know from history that Amon Gert arrived in Krakow to set up the Platzau concentration camp nearby. That was in 1942, and it was a position that Amon received as a reward for being what the SS considered an exemplary officer. In the movie, there's a scene where Oscar is riding horseback when he sees the ghetto in Krakow being overrun by Nazi troops. They're rounding up the Jews and forcing them onto trains bound for Plateau. During all of the chaos, one little girl stands out from the rest. She stands out because she's wearing a red coat, something unique in an otherwise black and white movie. It's one of the few times that we see color in Schindler's List. All of that is true. As Oscar was watching from a nearby hill on horseback, he happened to see a little girl in a red coat. Well, he didn't know for sure if it was a little girl. From that distance, he could just tell that it was a child in a red coat. But the mistress that he was with at the time commented to Oscar that it must be a little girl because only a little girl would be so obsessed over a bright shade of red like that. Just like we saw in the movie, Oscar watched her as she walked aimlessly. Around her, people were being beaten and shot as the Nazis were lining everyone up to get on the trains. This was a truly eye-opening experience for Oscar. Previously, he had seen the atrocities the Nazis were forcing on the Jews, but as he would later admit, he thought they were isolated incidents. Seeing this mass rounding up and blatant murder of innocent people in the streets made him realize all of those incidents he'd seen up to this point were not isolated. While the movie shows Liam Neeson's version of Oscar eventually riding away, in truth, Oscar was sickened by what he saw. Sliding off his horse, he nearly threw up right there on the ground. He managed to keep his food down, though, and instead just stayed there on his knees, hugging a nearby pine tree. He was in shock. Although this isn't in the movie at all, there was a PBS documentary called The Trial of Adolf Eichmann that actually offered some insight into who the child in the red coat might have been. It may have been the daughter of a man named Martin Foldy. Dr. Foldy would end up surviving Auschwitz, and in the documentary, he told the story of the selection process. As he explained, he and his 12-year-old son were told to stand in a line to the right, while his wife and their little girl, wearing her brand new red coat he had just gotten for her days before, were to stand to the left. After a few moments, an SS officer forced his son away from him, telling the boy to go find his mother and daughter in their line. Did he find them? We, we don't know, but it's not likely. Although Dr. Foldy survived, those were the last moments when he saw his family. Was this the little girl that Oscar Schindler saw? Honestly, we don't know. Maybe. But actually, in an all likelihood, probably not. In 2000, one of the survivors of the Krakow ghetto named Roma Ligaka wrote a book in which she explained that she was the little girl in the red coat. Her book is called The Girl in the Red Coat and is definitely worth a read. As an interesting side note, Roma didn't know about any of this at all until she saw Schindler's List herself. When she saw the little girl in the red coat, she was amazed and 
instantly knew that was her. Even though there's no way the filmmakers could have known, they only knew the story from Schindler's side. Some 50 years or so after the event, it was the movie that brought the real person forward. While Oscar Schindler never learned the true identity of the child in the red coat, just like the moment we saw in the film, it was an incredibly emotional experience. Seeing the brutal murders taking place was something that would change his life forever. Sadly, the real events were also something that lasted much longer than what we saw in the movie. While the film implies the Krakow ghetto was cleaned out in a day, in truth, it was an event that took place over a matter of years. However, the event we see in the movie most likely was in March of 1943 because that's when there was a massive liquidation, as the Nazis called it, of the ghetto as the Jews were taken to Platzau. We didn't really see this in the movie, but as these liquidations were taking place, Oscar would let the Jews who worked in his factory spend the night there to help avoid being rounded up. Back in the film, in the camp at Platzau, an indifferent Amon Gert starts off one of his days by taking a sniper rifle to his balcony and shooting people at random if they don't appear to be working hard enough. Sadly, this is true. We know from accounts of those who managed to survive that Amon Gert liked to spend many of his mornings on the balcony of his home overlooking the camp with his sniper rifle, shooting at children in the camp. According to some... Amon wouldn't have breakfast in the morning until he'd shot at least one person. We also know that Amon Gert's role as the camp commandant earned him a nickname, the Butcher of Platzau. One example of Amon's butchery was recounted at the trial for Adolf Eichmann after the war. If you're listening with kids, you might want to skip ahead a little bit. But in his statement, one of the Jews who had survived thanks to Oskar Schindler, a man named Moshe Beshki, testified, and I quote, The case of Ulmer, whose daughter lives in Jerusalem, and I know her. He was summoned by the camp commandant, Amon Gert. The camp commandant had two dogs, Ralph and Rolf, and he set the dogs on him. The dogs ate him up alive. Possibly a little breath still remained in him. He shot him, and he was killed. A group that appeared with food in its possession, a particular group of the Ablade Commando, a unit which was in charge of the offloading of goods from the railway station, they found food in its possession. Then the camp commander, Amon Gert, came up and asked whose food it was. When no one answered, he took a man whose name was Nachmanson and shot him. On the same occasion, he shot another man, Dissler. And then someone had the brilliant idea and said they had brought the food. Then everyone received 100 lashes. One of the men, named Mandel, remained lying there until the group was taken to the parade ground and there everyone received its desserts. He himself had to count the blows, and if he made an error in the counting, he had to go back to the beginning. There was an instance with that group where one of the older men was beaten and cried out a great deal, and after that had to go to Gert to inform him that he had received his punishment, and he thanked him for it. When he turned around, he shot him, and he too was killed. That's the end of Moshi's testimony. Torture and death were common in Platzau. And if you survived more than a month, you were considered lucky. The next major plot point in the film is when Oscar strikes up an unlikely friendship with the man responsible for the murder he saw on the streets of Krakow. This is true. Despite his disdain for the actions of the man, Oscar Schindler also knew that he would have to deal with the man in charge, Amon Gert, if he wanted to try to save some of the Jews. When Oscar approached Amon, he asked him if he could move some of the Jews to a subcamp that would be near his enamelware factory. His reasoning was that the physical location was closer to his business and that would help his workers get to work faster 
and thereby increase productivity. Surprisingly, Amongert agreed. Of course, the bribery that Oscar also offered helped too, I'm sure. And so it was that Krakow Zablosi was set up. That was the name for the subcamp of over a thousand Jews who worked in Oscar's factory. It was one of seven subcamps in the Krakow Platzow concentration camp, but it was obviously different than the others, at least obvious to us now. Oscar did all he could to keep it from being obvious to the Nazis. In the movie, we find out that even though he clearly doesn't care about the life of the Jews in his camp, Mon actually has a crush on a Jewish girl. Her name is Helen Hirsch, and in the film, she's played by M. Beth Davids. That's true, although there's more to the story. By that, what I mean is, Amon Gert didn't have one Helen, but two Helens. Helen Hirsch was a real person, and was indeed one of Amon's maids. His other maid was a woman named Helen Sternlicht. Like the movie shows, and like you can probably imagine from someone who doesn't flinch at sniping prisoners in the camp, Amon didn't treat his maids very well. In the movie, the next big plot point happens when a Jewish woman and her child bring a cake they've baked to Oscar Schindler. They do so in front of a number of Nazi officers who witness Liam Neeson's version of Oscar as he does something unthinkable to the officers. Kisses the woman. Later, Ray Fine's version of Amon Gertz tries to explain it away to his superiors as Oscar simply being a womanizer. It doesn't work, and Oscar is sent to jail. As we've learned, the womanizer thing was true, but as far as we know, Oscar never went to jail for kissing a Jewish woman. He did go to jail, though, so that part of the story is true. However, it was simply because of helping the Jews that he was sent to jail. In fact, it was while he was in jail that Schindler's List was created. So that would mean the scene where we see Liam Neeson and Ben Kingsley sitting there typing up the list wasn't true. But probably the biggest change was that it wasn't Itzek Stern who wrote the list. While we already learned that Itzek Stern was a real person, the character of Itzek Stern that we saw on screen was actually a composite character. There were three men who went into the character Ben Kingsley played. One of them, of course, was Itzek. The other two were Mailtech Pemper and Marcel Goldberg. It was Marcel Goldberg who wrote the now famous list of Jews who would be saved in Schindler's factory. And he wrote this list while Schindler himself was in jail, so it's not likely that Oscar had a lot of direct input on the names that went onto the list. With that said, Some have suspected that Marcel was open to bribery to get names onto the list. Even though he was of Jewish descent, by all means, Marcel wasn't nearly as wholesome as the character we saw Ben Kingsley play on screen. So maybe that's why they decided to make that change there. As if things weren't bad enough in Platzow, the movie is correct in showing that many of the prisoners didn't stay there. While no one inside the camp could have known, the tides of war were turning. On June 6, 1944, Allied forces landed in Europe for a massive offensive we now know as D-Day. Meanwhile, the Germans were being pushed back on multiple fronts. To the west, the British, Americans, and other allies were pushing the Nazis out of occupied France. To the east, the Soviet Union was making their own headway against the Nazis ever since they'd surprise attacked their former allies in 1941. With Platzow being located near Krakow in Poland, the Germans knew it was only a matter of time before they'd be overrun by the Soviets. So in July and August of 1944, the German high command ordered Platzow emptied and large numbers of prisoners from Platzow were transported to their death in other camps such as Flossenburg, Matheson, Stutthof, and Auschwitz. In the movie, Oscar Schindler goes to Amon Gert and asks if he can move his Jews to his hometown of Brunlitz. At the time, it was part of Germany, but today it's in the Czech Republic. To get some context, that's about 155 miles, or about 250 kilometers, to the west of Krakow, away from the advancing Soviet army. 
And again, surprisingly, Ray Fine's version of Amon agrees, and Oscar Schindler and the Jews working in his factory are allowed to leave. That is all true. When Platzau was ordered to be emptied, Oscar knew what would await the Jews in the other camps. It was now or never. While the movie shows Oscar petitioning Amon alone, there was more than just one person to make that decision. Oscar used any and all of his connections that he had made throughout the war. He bribed. He begged. He even traveled to Berlin to try to convince contacts in Germany's capital to let him take the Jews away from Platzau. And it worked. About 25,000 men, women, and children were murdered when they left Platzau and went to Auschwitz. About 700 men and 300 women did not make that trip and instead went to work in a factory in Brunlitz. In the movie, there was an issue when the trains with Oscar's workers leave Platzau. The men make it to Brunlitz fine, but the women and children do not. They were accidentally sent to Auschwitz. A paperwork mix-up, the Nazis claim. Angered, Oscar himself drives to Auschwitz to fix the situation. That is sort of true. One of the trains leaving Platzau headed for Brunlitz was indeed diverted without any warning and instead arrived at Gross Rosen. That's much further to the northwest of Platzau than Auschwitz was. But the real Oscar didn't go to the concentration camp to get things resolved. Instead, he went to the source, Berlin. And yet again, he bribed, begged, and did whatever he could to yet again get the Jewish workers sent to Brunlitz. And it worked. While the first of Schindler's Jews were sent from Platzau to Brunlitz in July of 1944, the last of them didn't arrive until November. Oh, and in the movie Back at Platzau, we see a scene where Amon Gert is burning massive piles of human bodies. As a wheelbarrow of human bodies passes by, Liam Neeson's Oscar Schindler notices the red coat. It's the little girl from before. Obviously, we know now that's not true. Fortunately, Roma Lagaka survived. But we can't fault the filmmakers for that. No one knew who she was for sure, and with millions of Jews murdered during the Holocaust, the usual assumption wasn't a good one. The rest of that scene is true. In January of 1945, with most of the prisoners already gone, the last of the prisoners were forced to march the 40 miles, or about 65 kilometers, from Platzau to Auschwitz. Those who managed to survive this journey were murdered upon arrival. Meanwhile, in Platzau, the entire camp was dismantled. Any bodies that had been buried in one of the countless mass graves in the area were exhumed and burned. So that's the pile that we saw in the movie. On January 20th, 1945, the Red Army reached where Platzau had been and found only an empty field. In the movie, Liam Neeson's version of Oscar Schindler has an emotional speech after the announcement of the war's end in his factory. For the first time, Nazi guards are allowed inside the factory to hear his speech. They take him up on his offer to leave instead of murdering the Jews before they leave. Of course, the speech itself was all fictionalized. But yet again, the spirit of what we see on screen is pretty accurate. Technically, Oscar's factory at this point was supposed to be making parts for the V-2 bombs that Germany was using at the end of the war. However, his factory never actually produced anything. They managed to stay alive and refused to build anything that might help the German army continue their killing. Despite not ever producing anything, they did a great job of looking busy. Oscar even went so far as to ask the Nazi Gestapo to send any Jewish fugitives to his factory so they could bolster wartime production. No production was bolstered, but the number of Jews in his factory rose. In the movie, after the war is over, Oscar says he must flee. After all, he'll be seen as a war profiteer. Before he does, though, 
Itzak gives him a letter explaining what Oscar did to whomever he may come across with signatures of every person in the factory. He also gives Oscar a ring with the phrase, Whoever saves one life saves the world entire. That's true. We know this from one of the Jews who survived, a man named Joseph Gross. He was one of the Jews working in Schindler's factory. According to Joseph's son, Louis, the ring was made out of gold from the fillings of workers, lead, and coins. So the scene where we see them pulling teeth from one of the workers to make the ring is actually pretty accurate. We don't know if Oscar broke down like he did in the movie after receiving the ring, but his statements in the film are something that's perfectly normal to feel. Why didn't I sell my car to pay for more bribes? That's ten people's lives. My ring, two more people, at least. Can you imagine what that must feel like? To know there's no way you could save everyone, and yet always feeling like you could have saved more, even if it's just one more life. The movie comes to an end as we learn the fate of Amon Gert being hung. Then there's a very dramatic scene at the end where we see the actors walking with the real survivors to place stones in tribute onto Oscar Schindler's grave. It is true that Amon Gert was hung. On May 7, 1945, Germany surrendered to the Allies. While technically this wasn't the end of the war because Japan hadn't surrendered yet, that's the end of the war that we heard about in the movie. That same month, Amon Gert was arrested by the U.S. military and extradited back to Poland for trial. It didn't happen right away, though. The trial lasted from August 27th to September 5th, 1946, and Amon was found guilty of being a member of the Nazi party, as well as being personally responsible for the imprisonment, torture, extermination, homicide, war crimes, and for, quote, personally killing, maiming, and torturing a substantial, albeit unidentified, number of people, end quote. On September 13, 1946, Amon was hung at the Montalupic prison. That's just a few miles from the Platzau camp in Krakow. As for Oscar Schindler, he and Emily, who had been by his side at the factory in Brunlitz, fled to Argentina. They didn't go alone, though. There were a number of Jews who went with him, as well as one of his mistresses. For a number of years after the war, they lived happily on a farm there. Then, in 1958, Oscar left his wife, Emily, his mistress, who apparently was still living with them the whole time, and the Jews who were living with them on their farm. He traveled back to Germany and spent the rest of his life traveling back and forth between Germany and Israel. No one really knows why he up and left his family in Argentina, but thanks to the countless number of bribes he'd had to hand out during the war, the once rich man had been reduced to poverty. By the end of his life, he was living mostly on donations from the Jews he had saved during the war. Oscar Schindler passed away in 1974 in the town of Hildesheim, Germany, at the age of 66. Even though he left his wife and mistress in Argentina, he wasn't alone at the time of his death. His new mistress was by his side. She was the wife of his doctor. Ever since the war, there have been a countless number of people wondering one simple thing. Why? Why would a member of the Nazi party risk their own life to save the lives of Jews that their party was murdering? Unfortunately, Oscar never really gave a single answer. He was asked many times, and his answers varied. Here's a few of his answers that he gave when he was asked why over the years. And I quote, I knew the people who worked for me. When you know people... You have to behave toward them like human beings, end quote. Or another one, quote, There was no choice. If you saw a dog going to be crushed under a car, wouldn't you help him? End quote. 
Another answer was given privately to one of the Jews that Oscar helped save, Murray Pantier. As Murray recounted, quote, He came to my house once, and I put a bottle of cognac in front of him, and he finished it in one sitting. When his eyes were flickering, he wasn't drunk. I said this is the time to ask him the question, why? His answer was, I was a Nazi, and I believed that the Germans were doing wrong when they started killing innocent people. And it didn't mean anything to me that they were Jewish. To me, they were just human beings. I decided I am going to work against them, and I am going to save as many as I can. And then Murray continued by saying, And I think Oscar told the truth, because that's the way he worked. On a different occasion, Oscar explained how much he hated the Nazi party that he was a member of. I hated the brutality, the sadism, and the insanity of Nazism. I just couldn't stand by and see people destroyed. I did what I could, what I had to, what my conscience told me I must do. That's all there is to it. Really, nothing more. To learn more about the true story behind Schindler's List, I recommend reading the book that the movie is based on. It's called Schindler's Ark and was written by Thomas Keneally. Although, since the movie's been released, they actually have an updated edition renamed to Schindler's List. Just look for Thomas's name and you'll know you're getting the right book. I'd also recommend picking up Roma Ligaka's book called The Girl in the Red Coat. It's obviously not from Schindler's perspective, but it's still worth reading to get into the moment or what was happening at the time. Lastly, if you want to see the list of Jews saved, you can find that over at oscarschindler.com slash list.htm. That's Oscar with a K. There's also a plethora of documentaries and other information out there that you can find. I'll make sure to add the links to those books, the list itself, and more resources over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com. Before we get to the answer to the two truths and a lie game, Let's try to end things on a little more positive note. I wanted to say a quick thank you to Lynn for sending me an amazing book called From Bremerton to Philadelphia, 1943 to 1946, The Untold Story of the Heavy Cruiser USS New Orleans CA-32 by Carl Hartzell. Carl was one of the men aboard USS New Orleans during World War II. Another man aboard the ship was Lynn's father. And after hearing the story we learned about in the USS Indianapolis episode, she was kind enough to send me this rare book filled with little known facts and details about USS New Orleans. It's an amazing story of a ship during World War II who had about 150 feet of her bow blown off when she was hit by a torpedo in 1942, but was repaired and finished out the war. Unfortunately, the book is copyrighted, so I can't really share anything out of the book on the podcast directly. And it's out of print, so it is a little bit pricey if you try to get it yourself. But I'll make sure to add a link to where you can find some pictures of the USS New Orleans and learn more about the story. And I will include a link to the book as well. Thanks again, Lynn, for sharing the book. Okay, shifting back to the story that we learned about in this episode, it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. As a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one. Oscar Schindler was officially a member of the Nazi party. Number two, its extern was the one who typed Schindler's list. Number three, the girl in the red coat didn't actually die at the Platzau camp. Did you find out which one is a lie? The lie is number two. As we learned, since the girl in the red coat recognized herself in the film and wrote a book about it, obviously she didn't die. But it wasn't Itzhak Stern who wrote the list. He was certainly involved and played a crucial part to ensuring the saving of over a thousand human lives. But that scene we saw in the film with Liam Neeson's version of Oscar and Ben Kingsley's version of Itzhak wasn't really accurate. Thanks again for listening. You can join the Based on a True Story Facebook group at 
facebook.com slash groups slash based on a true story podcast. And if you want to see some photos of the faces and places behind each episode of the podcast, you can follow the show on Instagram at based on a true story podcast, or you can find me directly on Twitter where I'm at Dan Lefeb, D-A-N-L-E-F-E-B. Feel free to shoot over in questions you might have, or maybe you're not a fan of social media. You can shoot me a good old fashioned email at Dan at based on a true story podcast.com. Thanks so much for listening, and I'll chat with you again really soon. <laughs>